Hey, welcome back to the channel. My name is Seam Lund and today we're doing another Instagram Q&A where I'll be answering different kinds of questions. If you want to ask me a question and you want to get it answered, then the best way to do it is to follow me on Instagram where I do these regular Q&As. And to also subscribe to this YouTube channel where I do a video about the Q&A in a longer format. This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, formerly known as Blue Blocks. My favorite light and seat position companies, Blue Blocks, has rebranded themselves as Bond Charge. They're now involved with a huge range of evidence-based products to improve your wellness and life in every way. Their extensive range of premium wellness products helps you to sleep better, perform better, have more energy, recover faster, balance your hormones and reduce inflammation. My favorites are their red light light bulbs because they can be used to create a melatonin friendly environment in your bedroom by shining only red and not blue or green light waves that will reduce your sleep quality. After starting to use these red light light bulbs, I find it much easier to fall asleep and feel less awake before bed. If you want to try out these amazing products that are the cornerstones to my most optimal sleep, then head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code seam15 to save 15%. Alright, so first question, supplement that reverse insulin resistance. So, you know, <laughs> before I begin, I'll have to say that, yeah, probably the most important thing you, you can do to reverse insulin resistance is the lifestyle thing, diet, exercise, good sleep, and uh, that kind of thing, stress management. Uh, I do think that, you know, there are still a few uh, compounds and supplements that could benefit or that have been shown to help with improving insulin sensitivity and uh, reducing aspects of di di diabetes type 2. Berberine is probably the most potent of the natural, let's say, glucose disposal agents or things that lower blood sugar levels. It's uh, you know, relatively safe. There's no, yeah, you may get nausea or something like that. It may inhibit like muscle growth if you take it all the time, uh, but generally it does work very good in uh, reducing blood sugar levels I do like to take it myself for like 400 milligrams. When I am eating like a higher carb meal, that's great for that scenario. But there are other also, let's say, uh, less uh, detrimental for muscle growth as well that actually improve muscle growth at the same time. So things like chromium picolinate that has been used to um, help with uh, di type 2 diabetes as well as insulin resistance. And uh, doses up to like 1000 micrograms is something that I personally take as well on uh, some days where I've lifted. I don't want to like inhibit mTOR with berberine. I want to take something that actually just enhances insulin sensitivity and helps with glucose disposal. So chromium picolinate, uh, regular one, is uh, perfect for that. I take yeah like 500 to 1000 micrograms on the days that I lift and I also eat carbohydrates. So I'm not going to take it if I don't eat carbs, uh, but I do. And there are like some studies actually also as well in bodybuilders or people who lift and that it improves uh, body composition or nutrient partitioning. So even if you're not diabetic, it's uh, still a good uh, supplement to take, in my opinion, to help with uh, glucose disposal and maintain better insulin sensitivity. Besides these two, there's also things like, you know, magnesium and potassium that you need to have in point. Uh, uh, but yeah, those are the, probably the two most easily accessible and uh, one of the most effective ones that you can take to help with that. Some thing to remember is also like low sodium, low salt intake can induce insulin resistance even in healthy subjects in the short term. So um, yeah, just make sure that you get electrolytes, uh, magnesium, potassium, and um, and sodium. Best way to gain muscle without fat. So that's a very mm, you know kind of broad uh, question generally, but uh, the answer is still sticking to the fundamentals. <laughs> essentially, that you know you want to see progressive overload in your training you want to be in a small calorie surplus and you don't want to like overspill with uh, your calories and carbohydrates so yeah just main, try to aim for the one gram of protein per body weight do a good um, resistance training program that uh, emphasizes progressive overload where you get stronger over time the main compound lifts are good for that um, and uh, yeah make sure you don't overeat i like to stick to only like a 500 calorie surplus if i have wood to, trying to like you know, gain weight you don't need necessarily more than that even less is you know good enough like uh, over the course of uh, many years i've gained you know f at least five kilograms over the course of maybe three or three years of uh, just uh, eating at a slight surplus and uh, that surplus can be even as little as 300 calories now keep in mind that that surplus doesn't have to be like every day you, there can be days where you are in a deficit but the weekly surplus should still be slightly elevated and uh, that would um, basically prevent this uh, excess uh, weight gain in terms of body fat. You want to make sure that the 
uh, weight that you do gain would be muscle, not fat, and uh, like a smaller surplus, be more patient with it, yeah, it's going to take a longer time, uh, but yeah, if you want to minimize fat gain, then that's what you need to do. What's my workout routine? Uh, well, my workout routine is primarily, you know, I do uh, gym where I do with uh, barbells and dumbbells, usually like two to three times per week. And with calisthenics, I do also like one to two workouts per week. And uh, cardio, I do like one to two workouts per week as well. So I do something every day. Uh, let's say on Monday, I have a heavy gym session, which today is Monday. And uh, I did a shoulder workout, which was more emphasized on like pushing muscles. Uh, tomorrow I'll do like maybe cardio, nothing uh, re resistance tra training related. On Wednesday, I may do like a calisthenics workout on Thursday, I may go for like uh, squats, uh, leg day. And on Friday, I may do cardio again. On Saturday, I may do a pulling workout at the gym or just calisthenics. And on Sunday, I do like another uh, gym or, or cardio. So yeah, it kind of depends on the week. But generally, I do like a push, pull, leg, split, and uh, train with resistance training, either calisthenics or weights at least three to four times per week and uh, cardio also one to two times per week. I may have like one day for rest, but uh, usually even then I'll do something like, you know, maybe some mobility or yeah, like a longer hike or some easy cycling with a bike, for example. Top five fruits to eat. Uh, so I think that, you know, number one is going to be berries, which isn't fruit at all. Uh, technically it's a fruit, but it's still like berries. But I do think that berries are, you know, much better than fruit from both the micronutrient side and the sugar content side. The calories are lower, the polyphenols are higher, <laughs> that's what you want. Less calories, more polyphenols, less sugars, uh, and uh, they're tastier a bit as well. So uh, I do think, yeah, berries, blueberries, cranberries are my favorite, cherries, uh, raspberries, strawberries maybe. Uh, those would be like the number one spot. Number two spot would be, you know, I think that the best kind of fruit probably is like apples, uh, because, you know, it has pectin, which is good for a microbiome, and uh, it helps with actually, yeah, you know, satiety a lot. Apples are pretty satiating. They are very low in calories compared to other fruits. Uh, yeah, high fiber, generally like easy snack. Number three would be maybe like, mm, I don't know, watermelon is actually like a very good fruit. I don't know if it's a fr fruit. Uh, you know, it has fructose and stuff, uh, but it's not necessarily like growing on trees. <laughs> uh, regardless, uh, watermelon is high in citrulline, which is good for, uh, you know, blood flow. And actually, you know, when when you take like a pre-workout or when you take citrulline as a supplement, then, you know, watermelon is one of the highest sources of citrulline. Uh, so is that good? And number four, I like pineapple because of the enzymes. So it has these uh, digestive enzymes. Uh, specifically for uh, protein digestion, it has bromelain. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a pretty tasty one as well. It's a bit higher in sugar uh, or fructose than, let's say, apples or pears. Uh, but I think it's worth it because of the digestive enzymes. And lastly, I would say maybe bananas are pretty like, or kiwis actually, yeah, kiwis are good. I would put kiwis there because they're high, very high in vitamin C. They help with sleep, melatonin production. And uh, yeah, they're like relatively lower in uh, calories or uh, sugars compared to like a banana. Best rep count for best hormonal testosterone response on big moves at gym. So uh, the research does show that uh, the heavy compound lifts with barbells generally produce more of a hormonal response than isolation exercises and machines. So yeah, barbell squats, deadlifts, bench press, overhead press, rows, you know, pull-ups even, uh, those will elicit a bigger ho growth hormone as well as testosterone response. And the research specific on the rep side shows that the like heavier reps a little bit, maybe like, you know, somewhere around five reps is probably the most optimal response in terms of fatigue to um, response ratio. And uh, that would be yeah, like five reps, maybe three, three to six reps, probably all of those will have that effect, eight reps at max. Uh, that would be the most uh, beneficial for testosterone and the like load should be yeah still you know something that you can only lift for five times so, and that usually would have to entail that the weight is like 80 percent of your one rep max somewhere like that that's what the research uh, shows that we you know show a lot in uh, our book win with dr james as well nmn under age of 40 is it beneficial so i think that you know in, in Technically, anyone of any age can benefit from NMN. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, helps to raise your body's NAD levels. 
uh, whether or not you need it is a different story or how much you need it is a different story. Like, I mean, we all need NAD. Uh, we all have different levels of NAD. We all have different capacity to produce NAD, different requirements for NAD. You know, if you're very unhealthy, you're also exposed to a lot of oxidative stress in your environment and um, even like, you know, sun. If you get exposed to a lot of sun, for example, then you need more NAD or specifically NMN even to counteract UV radiation. Uh, so yeah, context dependent of what your lifestyle and what your situation. Uh, but regardless, I mean, if you can afford it, then I mean, why not? Uh, in some like infrequent doses, if you can't afford it, then I wouldn't say that you kind of have to have it in that sense. Um, or, any, or it's not like the biggest priority. Like the bigger priority would be even like creatine is probably more important uh, as a priority than NMN for any age. Uh, but regardless, yeah. Under 40, it would be beneficial to take on some days if you're, let's say, underslept, you're jet lagged, you are under particular high amounts of inflammation or oxidative stress, then you can use that NMN to basically boost your levels in the short term. Uh, but I wouldn't say that it's like inherently needed because your body is still relatively healthy or it's not aging as rapidly as it will after 40s. Uh, so you're still able to basically produce NAD yourself. You just may have to make sure that the machinery in your body that does produce NAD through the salish pathway is optimized. So that includes, you know, uh, the circadian rhythm, sleep, exercise, and sometimes eating. Those things have to be basically aligned and working properly. Any experience on peptides? Any recommendations? I haven't used any peptides besides PPC-157, which is essentially like a healing peptide used for usually injuries and uh, yeah, pain or the inflammation those kind of things uh, i haven't had like any injuries or any like thing to see whether or not how big of an impact it has on me specifically my you know wife actually did back then a year ago have like a knee injury from a bike accident which was quite you know nagging for many months and it didn't heal that well when i came with ppc 157 and give it to her then that was one of the things that you know she did see some improvements i think obviously she did many other things she did infrared she did collagen she did uh, lifting weights she did squats uh, she ate more protein took essential amino acids Mm, those kind of things so glucosamine as well so there was many things that you did do, do uh, but but the BBC 157 was one of the things that I think that um, you know helped a little bit at least um, and there is uh, research to suggest at least in you know other animals that it helps with regeneration uh, there is no human clinical trials because of you know probably because it's so new uh, and uh, people already you know it's not like approved as a as a compound or a supplement uh, and of course the inconvenience usually you have to inject it which is somewhat inconvenient and uh, people don't like needles the ppc that i gave my wife and uh, the one i took myself is actually oral ppc so a tincture so just you know the first uh, oral orally available ppc 157 that is uh available only through uh, bioprime supplements and uh, yeah that's the one that we use and I do think that it's you know much more better alternative than injecting yourself with needles, uh, which for the average person isn't probably worth it, or they just won't want to do it. Best the non-natural biohacks. So uh, you know, non what's natural. You know, you could say that taking creatine is not natural, but creatine is a like a natural substance, or you know, yeah, you create it um, artificially, but it's still like a natural substance itself. Uh, that your body has and produces so i would say that you know infrared probably red light because you're creating those wavelengths artificially those are one of the best ones uh, for the health maybe like peptides you know i do believe that peptides probably will be more used in the future right now they're just new i haven't found a reason to take them myself uh, but in the future they probably will be used more and i do think that you know once the technology advances and uh, the science behind them also becomes more clear, we may probably have like, yeah, this new category of, you know, let's say supplements or they are not supplements, but uh, peptides that uh, could have like some interesting effects on, especially like anti-aging and uh, longevity side. Uh, and lastly, maybe, you know, yeah, creatine or something like that. I think, yeah, creatine, I'm a huge fan of creatine. I think it's, yeah, the most, one of the most effective supplements 
although it's you know a natural uh, compound any benefits to moonlight exposure <laughs> so uh, I don't think so like uh, if any then it's probably worse because of the bright light it still can keep you up I don't think there's any mm, like the wavelength benefit that you get from the Sun because it's still a reflection of the Sun right the uh, moonlight so that's not something I think um, is worthwhile and on the days or the nights that there is moonlight then my sleep quality is generally a bit worse or it, it's a bit harder for me to fall asleep because of the light so yeah the light will definitely keep you up I don't think there's any like direct benefit from the uh, uh, moon moonshine or moonshine is a different thing but you know moon shine in terms of the light coming off the moon I don't think there's any benefit to that uh, I don't think there's any benefit to moonshine the booze either but um, a different story best food post-workout many thanks in advance best food post-workout yeah I mean protein and carbs something that um, activates protein synthesis you need at least 2.5 grams of leucine which you usually get from 30 grams of protein I would go for a bit more depending on your weight on your protein goals but at least 30 grams of protein and up to like 50 grams if you're a male for example and carbs something because I mean people have a this you know false I know, narrative or idea about insulin and carbs that you know it's gonna make you fat but I mean insulin is the most anabolic hormone in your body and uh, yeah it is very beneficial for you know post-workout recovery and shutting off even like some of the mm, stress response and uh, helping with mTOR activation and muscle protein synthesis so 30 grams of protein 50 grams of protein and some carbohydrates I like I like potatoes <laughs> maybe rice if you're a fan of that but yeah some potatoes are good how do you know if you have familial hypercholesterolemia with ApoB and ApoA1 markers well I guess you have to do a blood test or so, sorry like a genetic test a DNA test uh, to know that so like self decode or some other of those uh, platforms do, 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 any suggestions to someone whose thyroid has been removed um, so that's a question I've gotten quite often I think that you know given that the thyroid is removed it doesn't mean you know it's it would impede with aspects of metabolic rate or it like you know regulating body temperature and your uh, metabolic rate etc which could like theoretically put you in risk of like weight gain and diabetes and those things but uh, I think that uh, there's many other ways to regulate your metabolic rate and uh, leptin levels even without without uh, I think that uh, there's many ways you can regulate your uh, metabolic rate and uh, leptin levels without you know or yeah I mean the, the thyroid is important but uh, you can still raise your metabolic rate with the right diet and exercise and those kind of things you will still burn calories um, I, maybe like a higher protein intake would uh, help to mitigate some of the lack of thyroid function uh, and uh, yeah like a higher carb intake as well probably can help that because carbs still have a higher thermic effect of food than uh, fats and uh, they also help with leptin levels is matcha good for brain in case of enhancing memory I haven't looked into that specifically but uh, the generally the polyphenols and antioxidants are good for the brain so I do think that it's not gonna hurt I think it would probably have like some protective effect because I mean coffee it is uh, associated with you know reduced Alzheimer's and reduced cognitive impairment or cognitive decline so and dementia so I think matcha is very similar to coffee in that sense do you do protein shake both before and after workout so me personally no I don't do it afterwards I do it only before or during the workout so I only do one protein shake in that time frame not after because I don't I don't think I need it but if you're struggling with meeting your protein goals then yeah why not most important nutrients for adrenal health uh, I think you know let's say adrenals stress um, being fight or flight then probably carbs <laughs> again I mean carbs are probably more important um, shutting down like the sympathetic nervous system um, in terms of maintaining like resilience stress resilience then you probably don't want to over over stimulate it so it's a, like a fine balance or a different situation between shutting off like a sympathetic uh, stressed out response which you can do very easily with carbs even like you know simple sugars will shut off it in the short term but in the long term 
uh, if you are like constantly eating that sugar and carbohydrates then um, it will have like a like a negative effect on your adrenal resilience or stress resilience so I think that it's a hard answer maybe like I would say from a nutrient side then obviously you need like magnesium and uh, chromium and uh, salt as well um, but from a food side I would say maybe like could be even protein um, I don't think that yeah fats probably won't have like any particular effect on the adrenals directly but yeah in a short term carbs in the long term probably like a protein esque intake what's the most important thing you do for optimal sleep uh, well I personally think the light environment is huge uh, so I block out the blue light I have red light bulbs in my bedroom and yeah that always works uh, very good ba -ba -ba. how much water to drink in day um, that's um, we have another question also how much water for muscle growth <laughs> uh, I don't I don't know if um, you know water definitely helps with muscle hypertrophy indirectly or it's not going to build muscle but uh, it does help with like you know fluid accumulation in the muscle so you want to have water inside the muscle you're gonna look bigger more fuller you probably perform better as well and you know creatine taking creatine you know usually think that creatine makes you hold on to water yes but creatine makes you hold on to water in the right places which is the muscle tissue that's where you want to have the water not under the skin and uh, that's actually you know one of the benefits of creatine that you accumulate or you hold on to the water more easily um, but you hold it in the in the muscle tissue which is great for that how much water you should you should drink uh, depends on you know how much you sweat and that kind of thing i think you don't want to like force force feed yourself water and you want to you don't want to go to the bathroom like you know i don't know 12 times or 20 times a day um, usually something like you know still eight cups of water is fine if you drink it per day and uh, maybe like 10 12 is also fine there's yeah like a very no like specific answer to give it depends on yeah, how much you sweat and and that, that kind of thing next question how to protect skin from sun damage and photo aging without sunscreen this may be a bit of a controversial one uh, I don't think that you know it's very smart to use sunscreen all the time in some situations it's probably more worth it <laughs> if you are let's say at the equator or um, if you're let's say used to being at a higher altitude then you go to closer to the equator then it may be smarter to use a sunscreen in that scenario in the short term obviously you're not gonna get cancer <laughs> if you use sunscreen once or twice uh, in the chronic uh, use I don't think that it's yeah worthwhile uh, what you can still do is you know you can build up your body's ability to tolerate sunlight and you're gonna get less burned things for that you just have to be smart about it don't be stupid and be hours out in the Sun um, you know there are benefits to Sun of course but it's still true that it will accelerate photo aging on the skin it will you know cause wrinkles faster even if you're just interested in that then that's still true even if there are benefits to the sun i mean you know fasting can be also good but you can also you know <laughs> lose all the muscle and uh, be harmful for you in other ways and that applies to everything else as well so don't be stupid don't be hours out in the sun you know you can use you know hats that cover your face specifically if you're deliberately trying to cover your face um, you can use maybe this i don't know what you call it gobbles <laughs> um, these like uh, circle hats that uh, have a wider cover that uh, cover more of the face than like a baseball cap and um, a cowboy hat that's a, that's what it's called and uh, there's you can use like you know longer sleeved uh, clothes there's nothing you know wrong with that there you can use you know you have to make sure that you're not basically eating a crappy crappy diet because yeah I think that the seed oil intake and high omega-6 intake can make it more susceptible to get sunburned uh, I think that uh, you need to have high levels of NMN and NAD which um, can counteract the oxidative stress and UV radiation from sunlight so uh, yeah you still have to do the healthy lifestyle etc 
be smart about it in gradually increasing your resilience against it. So it's like a hormetic effect. You can use even like red light panels to probably induce that and uh, build up that resilience. So um, yeah, you can maintain that if you have like some sort of red light panel at your home. Uh, maybe infrared saunas, I'm not sure about that. I can do that as well. But yeah, I mean, the main, if you're not going to use sunscreen, then you have to be smart in other ways that you have to just uh, not expose yourself to unnecessary amounts of sunlight for hours and hours and hours. Because yeah, I mean, even if it is healthy, even if you're not going to get skin cancer from sun, then I think it's still true that it will accelerate photo aging in terms of, you know, damaging the skin. And I mean, you can also maintain uh, skin, let's say, turnover by eating, you know, protein and collagen and those kind of things. But yeah, the sunlight will still accelerate photo aging uh, regardless from the aesthetical side, just the aesthetic uh, visual side. Do, do, do. Why does sauna in the evening? Won't it make your body try to lower core temp and help sleep? So, uh, I, I mean, I think that the sauna will just rage about the temperature. I don't think that it's going to cool it down. <laughs> because you know, if you take the sauna and, and like high heat, especially, then you will may be like heated for many hours after that. And, um, and this course is a cardiovascular workout as well. The, in a small effect that, you know, elevated heart rate, you can be stressed out maybe for a longer time. If you're a healthy person, then probably not. But like elderly folks who do the sauna in the evening, probably they will have like a harder time falling asleep. Um, so it's better to do it like at least like five or six hours before a bit. If you're under 40 years old, what is the best longevity supplement beside NMN? I think that the best longevity supplement that everyone should consider taking, or two of them, I think are like glycine and creatine. So um, yeah, glycine for the methionine balance, that is pretty much um, for all ages. And uh, glycine also for glutathione, collagen, lowers blood sugar, <laughs> helps with inflammation, helps with sleep. So yeah, glycine is one of the, yeah, everyone probably you know could take it uh, with no real concern or no real reason what, why not to um, because you're also not getting that much glycine from diet creatine is very important you know for elderly but because of improving muscle strength and muscle mass and bone density as well as cognition so creatine is a longevity supplement it helps with cognition bones muscle strength fat loss uh, those kind of methylation yeah it's yeah very good and in your 40s or under 40s then taking creatine mm, it's going to like build up your reserve in terms of muscle mass and muscle strength and bone density because it's much easier to build strength and bone density in your 20s than it is in your 40s not to mention in your 60s although it's still possible the the changes that you will see in your 60s will be minuscule compared to the changes you could see in your 20s or 30s so you need to kind of cap out <laughs> or maximize your potential in terms of lifting and uh uh, like fitness to maximize your bone density and muscle strength because muscle strength is more the most associated with uh, longevity more so than muscle mass so even if you're not trying to build muscle mass muscle strength is still quite uh, good and important to do, do, do best seafoods based on micronutrients I think the best seafoods are you know oysters mussels clams maybe lobster more so than most fish um, in terms of the one, at, le at least in the micronutrient side, like you get a lot of zinc and chromium and manganese and molybdenum and um, copper from uh, these oysters and mussels. From a macro side, then I mean, yeah, like oysters have good macros, uh, but like fish is still a better macro from that. Like salmon has probably like the perfect macros, um, but uh, it also has good micros. It doesn't have just you know that much like chromium and uh, zinc and those kind of things. So yeah, I mean, my favorite ones are just. You know, salmon and herring is very high, actually the highest source of creatine, <laughs> more, more so than beef, funny enough. Um, so herring, salmon, mussels, clams, uh, oysters, as well as like the sea vegetables, like algae and uh, nori, wakami, those things, they're also very good. They're high in iodine and uh, yeah, they're great. Thoughts on HMB, superior to leucine in your opinion and worth adding? So yeah, I do take uh, HMB, I take it 
because of my extended fasting window. So I like eat one meal a day with a protein shake in before that. I take HMB in the morning to reduce the muscle catabolism. And um, yeah, I, that's something that, you know, that works for me. I've tried it, it works for me. And the research about HMB shows that it's not like some sort of <laughs> anabolic agent. Uh, it's not gonna help with muscle growth as, as long as you're eating like, you know, good diet and getting enough protein, etc. You probably don't need HMB to add, especially if you're eating like three or two meals a day even. You know, one meal of the scenario, the reason why I do it is because uh, I think that, you know, one meal a day can be, of, of, of course, it's much harder to build muscle with it, but it can also like, you know, mimic some aspects of sarcopenia in the sense that you aren't, you don't have like a long enough time frame to stimulate protein synthesis and it's harder to do that. So, um, you know, you want to make sure that you cut off as much catabolism from your day unnecessary catabolism from a day as you as possible and the HMB for me is um, the rationale for doing that you know yeah you you produce HMB from the metabolism of leucine so why not just take leucine the problem is that you know uh, you need a lot of leucine to get some HMB so to get three grams of HMB which is what I take and which is based on the research kind of the optimal amount or the maximum amount that elicits some uh, anti-catabolic effects three grams to produce that HMB, you need 60 grams of leucine, which is, you know, you need to 600 grams of protein, <laughs> which is, you know, impossible. Um, and uh, yeah, that's why I take HMB as a supplement. It works for me. I don't recommend it for people, or it's not worth it for people who are eating regularly or they're eating like a super high protein diet. Um, but in this one meal of the scenario, it's that works for me and worthwhile. For the elderly, I also think that it's worthwhile. So like if you're 50, 60, then I think that can be a good supplement to take as well to basically help with that, the sarcopenia side and uh, reduce muscle catabolism. And that's the last question of the Q&A. I didn't answer all of them. If you want to get your own question answered, then uh, follow me on Instagram at Seamlund. And I'm doing these Q&As quite regularly there. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like, subscribe, notification bell as well. My name is Seam. Stay optimized, stay empowered.